the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah in the southwestern United States. These are the members of Mission 118 at the MDRS. They call their assignment Kiwi Mars 2012. Their aim is to discover what it's like to live and work in an alien environment as a prelude to humans one day going to Mars, the Red Planet. The technology for explorers to reach Mars actually exists today, but the troubled global economy and the lack of political will are just two major challenges to be overcome before such a journey can take place. The lengthy duration of such a voyage is another hurdle, so without the conditions aligning favorably for the journey, it's unlikely we'll see footprints in the Martian dust any time soon. Nevertheless, the Red Planet is in our sights and within our grasp. But until a manned Mars mission is practical, what can we do to prepare for humankind's greatest exploratory endeavor? The answer for the crew of Kiwi Mars 2012 is to learn something about exploring and living on Mars right here without leaving Earth, and perhaps in some small way contribute to the next giant leap for mankind. The Mars Desert Research Station, MDRS, was built at the beginning of the 21st century by the Mars Society, an international non-profit organization devoted to promoting the exploration and eventual settlement of Mars. The MDRS comprises a habitat, a greenhouse and a wastewater recycling plant and nearby there's a small observatory. The habitat deliberately resembles a spacecraft that's landed on the surface of Mars. It's two stories high and approximately 10 meters in diameter. The ground floor is given over to a science lab, engineering bay, spacesuit storage and bathroom facilities. The upper deck is where the crew cooks, eats, plans work programs, relaxes and sleeps in tiny cabins. Crews spend rotations of two weeks each at the MDRS. They come from universities, science institutions, even space agencies from all over the world to experience this illusion of Mars. Kiwi Mars commander Haratina Mogashanu, who lives in New Zealand, first stayed at the MDRS in 2011 as part of a Romanian space agency crew. For me, this place is magical because it gives you the chance to feel the pressure and the challenges of being a field astronaut. And there are very few places on Earth that can make you do this because very few places on Earth have the equipment. She enjoyed the experience so much, she's returned with a Kiwi crew, or more precisely, an Australasian crew. By the time Harry had secured a slot in the MDRS schedule, she had little time to conduct a full recruitment process. We couldn't really do too much about that in the little amount of time we had, but um, these two Australians are very, very great guys, so they will only add to the crew. And at the end of the day, the uh, crews that will go on Mars will not be from just one country, but they will uh, be multicultural. So I think one of the issues that we're trying to address here is how do we get along being from so many backgrounds. I think this is the most important thing. 
So, with four crew members from New Zealand and two from Australia, drawn from Harry's network of colleagues and friends, Kiwi Mars 2012 is a trans-Tasman mission. Haratina is the Kiwi Mars mission commander and represents the Kiwi Space Foundation, which aims to foster a New Zealand space industry and education framework. Mike Bodner is executive officer and mission journalist, contributing daily blogs to the Kiwi Space Foundation website. With a particular interest in geology, Ellie Harley's role is Mission Specialist Planetary Sciences, while teacher Bruce Ngataiarua takes on the job of Health and Safety Officer, as well as communicating daily to an audience of school students in New Zealand. From Australia, artist Annalee Beatty supports Kiwi Mars 2012 as Mission Specialist Life Sciences, and is keen on exploring whether art might have a place in interplanetary exploration while fellow Australian Don Stewart, with experience in meteorology, is the mission's weatherman and engineer. But just how valid is a stay at the Mars Desert Research Station? What does the crew hope to contribute to the knowledge necessary to successfully reach and explore the Red Planet? This environment absolutely is an analogue for, for the real thing. There's no doubt about that. Look, even if you stripped all that away what a great place to come so for two weeks i'm just looking forward to being in a, a, a totally alien environment something i've never experienced before and i think the concept of living in a, a habitat which is back over there behind me for two weeks with strangers essentially is an intriguing one whether we'll all be speaking to each other at the end of it remains to be seen well, I hope as an artist I'll try and find, uh, I'll be able to work with scientists and collaborate to try and find other ways to interpret scientific data. Um, this is a field trip for me and I'd like to understand what a confined space is and I'd like to understand more about an extreme environment. It's a, an adventure in, in different regards for me. It's a geological adventure, that's for sure. When you see the, the photos of the, the area, you'll, you'll understand why. Um, it's an adventure about Mars. Uh, I do believe we have to go to Mars. I believe we need to go to Mars because uh, we have a responsibility to ensure the survival of the human species. And also to the sorts of factors that people need to take into account if they live, maybe if they set up a space station on the moon or on Mars or even in, I guess, a remote, a really remote, harsh environment on Earth. So in some ways, the sorts of things we're doing here it would be a little bit like going and living on Island in Antarctica for 12 months or a couple of weeks. Uh, it's really about how my experience here living on Mars will actually um, translate towards students in New Zealand and that they can get a better appreciation of what that means. This is why we're here actually. It doesn't matter what will happen in the long term, it absolutely has no importance what will happen. Important is what we will be learning from this experience. That's why we have MDRS, that's why we have uh, rotations, which means the period of time when a crew stays at the hub. It is a learning curve for everyone, for us, for Mars society and for humankind. Even before the mission officially starts, Health and Safety Officer Bruce Ngataiarua is faced with a medical emergency. I was just rushing. I pushed that door too hard and I sort of fell through. Annalee has fallen down the steps outside the habitat on the first day and twisted her ankle. If you just stay there and leave ice on it for a, at least 15 minutes, all right? I'll take down the swivel. Communications from the habitat prove difficult. So Harry and Mike drive the 11 kilometres to Hanksville, the closest settlement. Because um, although she says she's not broken anything, we cannot really be sure. And I would uh, like to have an X-ray or something like that done to her to make absolutely sure that she is safe. I think what's such a shame is uh, we finished the training on the ATVs, the quad bikes before, and Annalie had never ridden one before. And after the training, she went out on it. And spent about 20 minutes riding around. She came back with a big smile across her face and said, that was awesome. She was so happy. And the next thing, she's flying out the door and down the steps and, uh, oh dear, talk about going from one extreme to the other. It 
crew member of mine, she fell on the stairs and I think she twisted her ankle. I hope it's not broken, but because I have no way of knowing, I need to make absolutely sure. Is it possible we could get an x-ray done? 300 west. Awesome. Thank you so much, sir. Okay, see you soon. Bye. Not wanting to risk Anna Lee having a broken ankle, Harry elects to take her for the almost 90 kilometer drive to the nearest x-ray clinic. Yeah, it's yes. <laughs> not broken. Thank you for your help. Thank oh. you for your help. Do you want this closer? What the incident reveals is that any crews on Mars are going to have to cope with injury and illness themselves and be medically trained for any eventuality, from cuts and bruises to compound fractures. The nearest hospital to Mars is going to be not 90 kilometers away, but even at its closest, over 50 million kilometers distant on Earth. A $300 x-ray later and Annalee returns to confirm that it is just a sprain. Oh, $300 later. Look at that awesome... What a great job. And he left his child's birthday party to come in. Oh, wow. Cool and the x-rays are fine. So, it's so great. So but she faces a frustrating wait to see whether she'll recover enough to take an active part in the rest of the mission. First 24 hours, keep it elevated. Apart from that, it's going to be all right. He said maybe six weeks. Six weeks. Hmm. But it's not broken. Physical challenges apart, a psychological trial Martian explorers will have to face is living together in close confinement. In this respect, the MDRS is a good indicator of what to expect. The illusion is complete. Crew cabins are small and private space is extremely limited. Beyond the sleeping quarters, it's difficult to find privacy. Peace and quiet on Mars will likely have to be timetabled and occasionally negotiated. Living together in close proximity is nothing new. People have been doing it for centuries, and any family that's lived on board a small boat or in a camper van will know exactly what the challenges are. At night, in the MDRS for example, those who retire early are sometimes frustrated by the noise from those who stay up talking or watching DVDs. And personal habits, whether an ongoing sniff, a tendency to hum tunes, or the use of a certain repetitive phrase, are magnified by confinement. On Mars, the last thing you'd want would be tensions boiling over due to annoying personal habits, because it won't be easy to escape them. Even a quick stroll outside would involve getting dressed up in a spacesuit. And anyway, for safety's sake, it's unlikely you'd be allowed to go alone. Within two days of the mission, tensions are running high. Harry wants to fully enact a landing and arrival at the habitat, including a mock landing on Mars, reaching the habitat, and an arrival ceremony. The others, also suffering from jet lag and exhaustion, aren't convinced such an act is necessary and just want to begin the simulation. Are we landing on Mars tomorrow? Sure. Sure. Compromise. Okay. Do you guys want to? Well, the only thing I wanted to include in the landing is, is the cultural part. The arrival plan included a ceremonial burying of some rocks which Harry has brought all the way from New Zealand. By the way, it's not... Harry and I aren't arguing about this. Yes, no. It's not, it's not, no, it's not that Harry wants to and I don't want to. It's just what, what it's After much debate, it's agreed to abandon the arrival and delay the stone burial ceremony. We cannot do it. Fine. I think, um, you know, within the first 48 hours, we had all been suffering from um, tiredness, jet lag, um, we all deal with that in different ways. Um, maybe Ali just came out and was more overt about it. I certainly felt some tension, I have to say, in, in that time. I'm not a person who actually speaks out like that. Um, uh, but I did agree with some of her comments. Um, so when she spoke about it and she said, oh, does no one else feel the same way? I actually did say, yeah, I do feel the same way in some, res some regard. But I think it was more important to actually talk about that and um, for it not to be an impediment um, for the rest of the mission and so we could work it out 
Um, so airing it was the best thing, um, and I'm glad she did. So I was actually, I felt quite relieved after she said it, to be honest. However, Bruce has to exercise his health and safety authority to make sure Harry's enthusiasm for the mission doesn't override her own basic necessities. Hold her to eat something, otherwise she'll flake. Yeah. She's not coming out unless she's had breakfast, right? Yeah. So, yep. She said she'll eat. If she doesn't, let me know. Right. Harry's created a challenge for herself, though. After flying from New Zealand to Los Angeles, she then elected to drive all the way to Colorado to rendezvous with the rest of the crew. It took 15 hours, after which there was no time for rest before continuing on to the desert research station. At this point, Harry has been on the go for over 30 hours. But then Bruce has his own condition to manage. He's diabetic. But it's not until everyone's at the MDRS that he tells Harry. Out of concern, she restricts him from driving the quad bikes or going on field trips without full support. That gives a new dimension to the expedition. I don't think it will change too much because commanders on Mars or on any field expedition, they have to deal with emergencies. Even if they won't be able to come with us on the field, which is probably the case more for Bruce, surprisingly then for Analea, we will have plenty of work for them to do at the hub, especially that we need people to be in comms, in comms contact, and in a way, strangely, I'm a little bit relieved that we can have someone at the hub that is not uh, going to be upset that they're not going to go on a field trip, because as you know, we cannot have um, everyone out on the field, there have to be two people at all times in the hub. The MDRS crew's work involves necessary daily routines coupled with more specialist work such as geology field trips. Operationally on Mars, crews will have to undertake certain regular activities to ensure their habitat continues to function efficiently. Even here in the Utah desert, nothing can be taken for granted and flight engineer Don Stewart monitors fuel and water supplies daily. For the purposes of the simulation, the water and fuel tanks are regarded as being inside a controlled environment, so no spacesuit is necessary. Water on Mars is likely to be a major challenge. Even at the MDRS, water is rationed. Showers are limited to once every three days, and all water is used sparingly. Conservation for the Kiwi Mars crew also means being careful with toilet usage. Another aspect of isolation the crew becomes aware of is the importance of pumps. Pumping equipment on Mars will be essential and widely used for airflow, water transfer, hydraulic operation of equipment, airlocks, refrigeration, waste disposal and many other functions essential to survival and comfort. The Kiwi Mars crew is reminded of this when one of the water pumps fails, meaning Don has to resort to good old-fashioned science using siphoning to transfer water from the tank on the trailer to the habitat's main tank. I'll be prepared to wait for a little while, what do you think? I'll just put water on the top and then eat. And right. They're very yummy. Food is another challenge for those living in an alien environment. As with the water, the food at the MDRS is in limited supply and is largely dehydrated and freeze-dried to simulate the sort of provisions that early Martian explorers might have to take with them. The catering routine alternates between one day of cooking and the next more of a just-add-water approach. We made a muck-up yesterday with the cooking days. We actually went to cook and we didn't cook, so we're just going to put a whole tracking in now. Bye. And have a long cooking. cooking day today, and one tomorrow, and then cooking day cooking. Crews who stay at the Desert Research Station also participate in a nutrition study undertaken by Cornell University for NASA, and Kiwi Mars is no exception. Mission 118 crew members weigh themselves each morning and record the data. Each evening, they complete a survey about what they consumed, how it tasted, how it made them feel, 
whether they ate more, the same, or less than normal, and so on. This is done online and received by Cornell University's researchers. The nutrition study is one genuine practical contribution MDRS crews can make to a successful mission to Mars, incrementally building up a picture over time about how useful or effective various types of food might be. However, one challenge real Martian explorers won't face, hopefully, is the invasion of their food supplies by aliens, in this case, desert mice. The Kiwi Mars crew discovers on the third day that mice have successfully penetrated the pantry and eaten their way into some of the food stocks, which are discarded for health reasons. It's a blow, and from here on the crew keeps all rodent risky food in plastic bins that can be sealed shut. Next to the habitat is a greenhouse. Originally, this was built with the aim of recycling grey water and experimenting with growing different foods. However, it's fallen into disrepair. The grey water recycling equipment lying idle and the greenhouse shelves empty of plants. On Mars, it's possible astronauts will be able to extract water in the form of ice from below the surface. But on the long journey to reach the red planet, efficient water recycling will be essential, just as it is today on the International Space Station. Presently, the space station recycles just over 75% of its water, so it's not yet fully self-sufficient. But research into how water can be totally recycled promises to have tremendous benefits here on Earth, as well as for future space explorers. Although the atmosphere in the Utah desert is perfectly breathable, MDRS crews have the option of wearing simulated spacesuits for going on EVAs, extravehicular activities, including Annalee, whose ankle is now fully functional again. Spacesuits on Mars will have to cope with incredibly cold outside temperatures, an unbreathable carbon dioxide rich atmosphere, and extremely low air pressure. Okay, now you can wait five minutes and you wait for my Such suits are currently being designed and trialed. For example, at the same time as the Kiwi Mars mission, a group from the Austrian Space Forum tests a prototype Mars suit in Austria's Dachstein ice caves. At the MDRS, crew members simply wear overalls and boots for venturing outside, but kit up with backpacks containing air circulation equipment and helmets that, while not airtight, do at least give the wearer some idea of what future Martian explorers will have to contend with. Like the spacesuits, the Habitat's two airlocks are not pressurized or even airtight, but Haratina asks her crew to at least pretend they're waiting for decompression before venturing outside. Once outside, there will likely be three options for Martian explorers. Go on foot, travel on a motorized buggy of some sort, or pile into a pressurized rover, which would allow them to take off their spacesuits and travel longer distances in reasonable comfort. At the Utah station, crews have access to their own mock pressurized rover, a four-wheel drive SUV, though it's not practical or safe to wear the spacesuits inside the vehicle. Which means any such rover on Mars is going to either be restricted to two occupants or be much larger than the HAB's four-wheel drive. The Mars Desert Research Station's all-terrain vehicles, the quad bikes, prove an easier solution for exploring the local environment. Their range on Mars would be limited by the air supply of the spacesuits, however, though they could be fitted with auxiliary tanks if required. And, of course, they'd need to be powered by something other than a petrol engine. On Mars, human explorers will have the ability to do in a few hours or days what currently takes rovers weeks or months to achieve. 
Just being able to physically pick up or crack open a rock will provide a wealth of knowledge that, with rover technology today, is so limited and so slow to gather. Here in Utah, Mission 118 explores the desert landscape, searching for geological specimens and evidence of water activity, but today without spacesuits, as it's 36 degrees Celsius. The experiment is about um, understanding the geology um, of a catchment area, and so you can collect your gravels to uh, find out what's in them. In this particular gravel, we may have some Jurassic deposits, uh, Cretaceous deposits. We've got a lot of really, really cool stuff here. <laughs> a key clue to previous life on Mars, and the one that would be the holy grail of geological finds, will be fossils. In the Utah desert, fossils are plentiful if you know what to look for. On the ridge above the MDRS is a field of fossilized oyster shells between 60 million and 160 million years old, a clear sign that there was once water and marine life in what is today an arid desert. The strata, or different colored layers so obvious in the desert landscape, tell a fascinating geological story. Each sedimentary layer represents a different period of geological progress and gives clues as to what was happening tens of millions of years ago. On Mars, with rovers such as Spirit, Opportunity and now Curiosity, NASA's strategy has been to understand what happened to Mars's water by looking for particular rocks or features such as those that form when water is present, just as the Kiwi Mars crew is doing in Utah. Even on the observatory path beside the HAB, there's evidence of past water activity. These little balls are called concretions. And although they look man-made, they are actually perfectly natural. And they're made in a similar way to a pearl is made in an oyster, starting with a single grain, which then builds up over time, in this case, to become perfectly globe-shaped. Fascinating. But guess where else they're found? That's right, on Mars. They were dubbed blueberries by NASA scientists after they were discovered by Opportunity's close-up camera. You can see that there's these beds that are kind of going like this. Yeah. And then right above it, some of them going like that. And then you see this layer here of rocks that kind of extends into there. Totally different flow regimes. This tells you something about the speed of, of the flowing water that deposited the formation. Halfway through the mission, the Kiwi Mars crew hosts a visit by scientist John Rask from NASA Ames in California. So you can see how narrow, narrow this is. This was a fast flowing regime of, of water here, probably similar to what we were just standing on. John was a member of just the second crew to stay at the Mars Desert Research Station and has extensive knowledge not just of the Utah landscape but what to look for in terms of water, fossils and other evidence of life. The, the environment around the HAB is very interesting and it is relevant to Mars exploration. While it isn't a Mars-like atmosphere or Mars-like temperature conditions, it does have features that geologically look similar to what we have observed on Mars as well, such as inverted river channels, uh, steep gullies that are incising into cut banks of large buttes, uh, and other features that look like boulders laying around on these uh, plains that may have been eroded by liquid or flowing water. So the surface here has been dominated by water erosion, and in some places on Mars that is also true. It is hypothesized that life, if it exists on Mars, might exist in rocks or underneath rocks. And out here in Hanksville, around the Hab, there's very rich field sites that have hypoliths and endoliths colonizing underneath rocks and within rocks that gives scientists a chance, an opportunity to test their ideas, their, their theories and their hypotheses about the potential for life to live in rocks, perhaps on Mars. Back at the habitat, the crew's rock and fossil collection grows as the days go by. They've found fossilized shark's teeth, gypsum, and plenty of petrified wood, including, out in the field, a whole petrified tree trunk many millions of years old. 
I have managed to find some just oh, stunning specimens, petrified wood. Um, wood that looks like wood, like it was cut up this morning, um, but wood that's also been sil silicified and, uh, and, and, and it's, all, it's orange, it's red, it's yellow, it's green, it's beautiful. When you look around this landscape, you're seeing layers, um, very clearly delineated layers. Uh, it's called the Morrison Formation. It's sedimentary and was laid down over the eons by fresh water, by sea water, by desert, and by plant. Uh, everything's the same. So whether you're looking at a large scale or a tiny scale, everything is exactly the same. We were looking in this microscope just a second ago. Um, I asked you to look on the plate before you looked in the eyeglass. You said there's nothing on the plate, and when you looked in the eyeglass, there's a, there's a little pebble with pebbles stuck, stuck in it. And um, th that's the perfect illustration of what's going on out there in, in that landscape. Is, um, everything is made of the same. It's all on, on relative scales. Beyond the scientific work programs Martian explorers will have, there will be a need for recreation, for reflection, and for establishing their own personalities within the habitat and maybe on the Martian surface itself. Mascots, for example. Representing the two countries of the Kiwi Mars expedition are Tupua Kiwi and Kim the Kangaroo, reminders of homes half a world away. Mascots aside, one of the givens in terms of cultural identity is the symbolic planting of a flag. It was one of the first things the Apollo astronauts did on the moon and will likely be one of the first ceremonies to be performed on Mars. In Utah, there's a permanent flag on top of the MDRS habitat, the red, green and blue of the Martian flag. Red for Mars, and green and blue to represent what Mars could become in the future if terraforming were to result in the establishment of seas, lakes and vegetation. It's a flag of hope and ambition. But the Kiwi Mars crew members have brought a mixture of their own cultural identities and personal passions to Utah. Bruce Ngataiarua draws on his Māori heritage by painting and displaying the Māori flag. Haritina likewise celebrates her Romanian origins, while Don and Annalie realise they've forgotten to bring something important to them from Australia. Uh, this is Don Stewart's painting uh, over the uh, Australian flag, and he's painted the First Nation flag, um, the Aboriginal flag over the top, just to, um, just to highlight the fact that um, Aboriginal people were the original inhabitants of Australia, so we thought they needed a presence here. We thought that was missing, so he's painted over mine, he's painted over his own. Realising the artistic potential of the desert soils, flight engineer Don decides to turn some of the raw material into clay. What I'm going to do is to put in a tiny, tiny amount of water and let it sit overnight, and hopefully it'll come back to something like pottery clay. And I can either make maybe a little vase or Whatever, or maybe just some little souvenir discs for all the crew to take back to Earth. In the end, he chooses to make a bowl, though without any means to glaze or fire it, it's eventually returned to the desert. Annalie also turns her attention to art, preparing for a planned exhibition based on the mission. What I've been trying to do is I've been trying to do some um, drawings of people in space suits. So I woke up early this morning and I thought I'd paint um, Alexei Leonov. There he is up there. It's from his book, um, yep. Time and Perception in Space. Mm. So I just thought I'd try and warm up. I'm not really a watercolour painter. I'm, I haven't really trained as a watercolour painter, but anyway, look, I'm giving it a go. This will probably be the first of a number of um, impressions, <laughs> just to see if I can get the hang of the suit. Perhaps more important than what the crew has brought with them is what they send back. Each day, teacher Bruce communicates with the Kiwi Mars Mission Control at Wellington's Carter Observatory, where hordes of school students have been visiting and learning all about the mission and about the Red Planet itself. 
via online messaging, they send questions to Bruce and the crew about what the mission is doing, what they're looking for, what they're eating, and generally what it's like to live on Mars. So I'm telling them we eat all sorts of different foods. Um, uh, all of it is um, uh, rehydrated, in other words, we're just adding water, but it tastes just like the same kind of food that we've got um, in New Zealand. And um, a lot of them are getting a great kick out of that because, you know, they think it actually tastes quite different and horrible. The main questions I've been asking is about how we've been getting on here. Um, some of it's been about what the food we eat, some of it's been around, oh, how do you go to the toilet, um, uh, what's it feel like to be in a space suit, those kind of questions. Um, we've actually had a couple of schools come in specifically for Kiwi Mars because they are looking at space and they're looking at extreme life in um, their own um, studies at school and it's fitted in really well. We've had some really good comments from the teachers about that as well because it's actually, if they haven't learned a lot, I mean they've come with uh, an imagination and it's fired them up to actually learn more. So that's really great. On Mars, however, communication with Earth will involve a frustrating delay, anything up to 20 minutes, even though radio signals travel at the speed of light, due to the immense distances between the two planets. And so the Kiwi Mars mission goes on, with the daily routines, the field trips, and the ever-present spectacular desert landscape to explore. With just one day left of the mission, and by the light of a full moon, the Mission 118 crew, under Haratina's guidance, creates a ceremonial Māori compass using rocks on the ground. Haratina and Bruce also finally symbolically bury the rocks from Island Bay on the coast of New Zealand's capital, Wellington. They're from an area known appropriately for Mars as Red Rocks. By placing a Maori uh, star compass in here in, uh, in the solar garden at MDRS, I thought that um, we could put a symbol of our curiosity because the Polynesian people, the Maoris, are the people who actually travelled the furthest navigating by the stars. So they are, to me, the biggest um, symbol of, of this. So that's why I wanted to, to have it here. It's just a, a memento, a reminder that you have to keep your curiosity open.
After two weeks at the Mars Desert Research Station, the crew, on their last full day together, reflect on what the mission has meant to them. Seeing the uh, Lith Canyon, seeing the fossilised tree down in Lith Canyon was the highlight for me of all, because it represented life. So it was a beautiful fossil. It's all chipping away and eroding away, but it was just, uh, yeah, uh, that was a joy. It's the colour of the landscape. That's the big thing for me. I didn't expect it to be so beautiful. And how everything in it has adapted to it, I think has an analogy, and it's already been said here this morning, about how people adapt, about how creatures, if you like, because we're all creatures, adapt to their environment. And when you're outside there and you look at the little rivulets where water has run, that's where you find all the plants. And uh, you can see the life, the lizards, the, the other burrowing creatures, the, uh, even the ants building their, their homes. Um, and we've been here for two weeks building our own home, transient though it is. But I think even in that period, there's been adaptation on our part. I was extremely impressed with that. The amount of learning that I had from this place, like the, the stuff that Ali taught us about the stones and the geology of the place and everything, that was just amazing. And I'm just so much richer going back home now than I came two weeks ago. It's just unbelievable how much I've learned. One of the big highlights here is to actually, um, was to actually communicate with the students. Um, uh, the views have been great, but to be able to actually communicate that to them um, live and, and synchronously as well um, has been a real joy for me. It's like being a huge classroom. I loved it. I think the highlight for me while we've been here is seeing uh, Factory Butte. Uh, it's so impressive the way it just sticks out in the middle of nowhere and it's draped by all that beautiful grey Mancos shale because it really is symbol symbolises, if you like, just the, how incredible the whole landscape is, even immediately outside the hab, you walk outside the hab, it's incredible. And, uh, you know, I mean, and our place in it for the last couple of weeks, the whole, has been just a highlight in general, it's been great. You know, we've actually, I think we've done really, really well just to live and sleep and work together all this time without, without anyone losing it. And, uh, and so, on the final day, it's pack-up time. But apart from the rewarding experiences the crew takes back, and kilograms of geological samples in Ali's case, cynics might say they haven't really contributed to humanity's next giant leap, and that this has all been just an illusion. For a first start, we did all our um, research, we did all the EVAs, we collected the samples, we took the pictures, we described in our words how the uh, Martian surface might look like for the schools back in New Zealand. We interacted every day with them through Carter Observatory, so I think it, it was a, a very, very successful mission. But it depends on what objectives you've got by coming here. And every single organization sending people here has different agenda. So um, I reckon it's exactly as you would go to a, to any camp, any other camp. Just the, the uniqueness of this place is that it's uh, insisting on keeping people in sim. And as I said, the sim is as real as you uh, as you can have it. I'm happy. I'm. I don't care if. Uh, um, this is made of titanium alloy or of uh, uh, wood. What I care about is what you get out of it. So it's mission accomplished for Kiwi Mars 2012. Perhaps the Mars Desert Research Station offers crews a chance to realize their own potential more than contributing to the potential for us to reach Mars. But in the end, the more we understand ourselves, the better prepared we are for the future.